Good afternoon, everybody. This is FSI session 204, Goldman Sachs Reinventing Financial Data Analytics. My name is Balaji Gopalan, Principal Solutions Architect with AWS. I work with financial services customers in terms of how to architect on the cloud in a secure, scalable, and reliable way. I'm also part of an industry-wide working group on, in terms of data management on the cloud. We've been closely working with Goldman Sachs on reimagining financial data analytics on the cloud. It's been a great pleasure to actually welcome Andy Phillips and Francis Giannara to share their story with us. Take it away, Andy. Thanks, Balaji. We're really excited to be here. So Francis and I are from Goldman Sachs, and we're here today to talk about how we're reimagining our data analytics platform on the cloud. So by way of introduction, I'm Andy Phillips. I've worked at GS for around 15 years um, in a number of different roles across engineering. So uh, software development, systematic trading, and more recently, digital product development. Uh, currently, I run product strategy for Marquee, which is our external uh, digital platform for our global markets customers. Um, and I also lead our uh, financial cloud initiatives for institutional customers. And I'm Franz Gennaris, and I head up financial cloud for data. So a quick agenda of what we're going to talk about today. So first, we're going to do an introduction to Goldman Sachs uh, and frame the type of quantitative analytics problems uh, that we work on day to day. Then we're going to go for a technical deep dive uh, on how we re-architected our platform on AWS with a particular focus on real-time data management, data modeling and integration, and then how do we create an analytics ecosystem to interact with that data. Finally, uh, what we've learned from moving our, our software to AWS and what we're taking on next. So before we dive into the technology, a quick overview of Goldman Sachs. So we're a diversified global financial services firm, and our clients range from consumers through our markets business uh, to institutional clients, including the world's largest and most sophisticated hedge funds and asset managers. As with most businesses today, technical innovation, velocity, and scale are critical for us to be competitive. 25% uh, of our workforce is engineering, including Francis and myself, uh, and we both sit in our global markets division. So that's our sales and trading division. Uh, our goal there is to help clients uh, manage a variety of different kinds of risks, which we'll talk about. Um, we're super focused on the cloud and developer services, um, both as an enabler to rapidly build new businesses, um, but also really we believe that developers uh, you know, are a critical customer segment for the firm and really will be a driver of growth for the industry as a whole. So that's Goldman Sachs. We're going to dig a little deeper to our area of focus, Francis and I. In the background, you'll see our trading floor in London. So here are all the different people on the trading floor, and what do they do? So here's an entirely non-exhaustive list of the kind of people you'll find on the trading floor. From left to right, salespeople. So they cover our clients, they help them manage a diverse range of risks, and they help them meet their investment objectives. Uh, this can include risks that they want, and risks that they want to offset or transfer to our trading desk. Traders execute those transactions, and they manage the result and risk for GS. Engineers and quants build the technology and models which GS and our clients use to accomplish these workflows. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about these two personas today. Uh, just one thing to note, there are increasingly blurred lines between the skills required for these different roles as more and more people become proficient in coding. And we're going to talk a little bit about how our tools enable people um, you know, to interact with data and analytics across different workflows. So as I mentioned earlier, Francis and I sit in our global markets division. So we're going to go through a quick example of the kind of risk we help our clients manage. Uh, we're going to focus on something, uh, you know, economic dynamics, which are particularly topical at the moment as the world shifts to more sustainable energy. So corporations here, and that includes airlines and auto manufacturers, they have a demand for materials, including things like aluminium for manufacturing uh, and nickel for battery co uh, construction and production. These require energy to fabricate, um, and also the transportation sector as a whole you know, requires energy in order to meet customer demand for travel. These different market participants need to manage their supply and demand economics. Um, they're exposed to the economy as a whole, um, and they're also exposed to flight uh, fluctuations in the different assets which they may want to hedge. Uh, GS is a key partner to all of these different constituents uh, in terms of managing risk of changes in inventory and changes in, uh, changes in asset prices. Finally, uh, asset managers and hedge funds, they invest in both the commodities and the companies in order to deliver returns to their own investors. Okay, so we're going to look at an example of a typical kind of quantitative analytics problem that we might try and solve. Um, and we're going to focus on this domain. So we're going to consider the impact of, in the economy in March 2020. So this is the onset of the uh, global pandemic. 
and really global travel plunged uh, you know, at the onset of the pandemic. And obviously, you know, there was a reaction in the market, so airline stocks dropped significantly right, due to short-term expectations around future revenue. But do we think the inherent quality of airline stocks fundamentally changed? Well, probably not. So the question here is, can we take uh, this concept and extend the idea to create an investment strategy, which essentially tries to buy high-quality stocks that are trading at a discount? And this concept is probably pretty familiar to everyone here, particularly at this time of year. So buying high-quality goods on a marketplace, for example, Amazon, at discount prices. So this is what we're going to try and do in financial markets. OK, so we can actually test this hypothesis by building portfolios that select stocks quantitatively, which meet these uh, the quality and value uh, factors, um, and then running a historical simulation or backtest to see how it performed. And we can do the selection of stocks by looking at things like earnings, balance sheet, stability, and profitability. So we're going to use this problem to frame the talk uh, with a goal to show how the right technology can rapidly accelerate how we can solve problems like this. OK, so how do we go about solving this kind of problem? This is probably going to be pretty familiar to anyone who's performing kind of data science or research type projects. Firstly, set up the infrastructure that we need. Secondly, source and clean the data that we're going to need to run the analysis. Thirdly, develop code to actually evaluate the performance of our strategy in sample and out of sample. And then obviously, we want to productionize our strategy. And for us, uh, that generally means executing trades in a live market and managing st uh, significant amounts of risk on an ongoing basis. OK, so we're going to go into detail on the platform we created to solve these problems. And we split the talk into three main sections. From the bottom to the top, tick database. So essentially, uh, how do we manage vast amounts of market data, often updating in real time, at scale, on the cloud? Secondly, once we've got the infrastructure, how do we integrate different data sources? How do we accelerate the time to value for new data feeds and new sources of data? And finally, how can we build analytics that can enable the different people we spoke about on our trading floor to interact with this platform in different ways? And of course, the prerequisite cloud slide, um, these themes are probably common to most of the talks that you guys will see at reInvent, but how does this affect us specifically? Well, Firstly, how can we increase the velocity that we can enter new markets or build new businesses leveraging the latest technology on the cloud? Uh, secondly, how can we scale our infrastructure to respond dynamically to changing market conditions? And thirdly, how can we enable collaboration across the different personas that we outlined earlier and collaboration with our clients? And this is things like moving from Excel-based workflows to Jupyter Notebooks and the like. OK, part one. So we're going to focus on this time series database. So firstly, what's special about market data? So I think most people are probably familiar with time series databases in the context of metrics or IoT. Um, but what's really special about market data and the infrastructure we need to use to manage it? Firstly, we're dealing with generally large sparse tables with many different columns updating at sometimes up to nanosecond resolution frequency. And it's critically important for us that the most recent data is available at very low latency. So what's happened most recently in the market is generally most important. However, we still need access to all of the historical data for backtesting other types of workflows. Secondly, we need to know when something happened. For example, when did a price update or a trade happen? But we also need to know when did we see it in our systems. So we have this concept of bitemporal data, and we need to track both of those time dimensions. And thirdly, when something goes down or something goes wrong in our infrastructure, we can't just move on. So we have to backfill data in real time um, you know, as our systems are running. Uh, so that we have an accurate view on the full history of market data uh, throughout the day. And obviously, that's critically important for our algorithms and risk management that we're operating. Um, all of this needs to happen at scale. Um, so just on an average day, we're, up, we're uh, receiving probably in the order of 700 billion uh, different price updates across 150 different markets globally. So that's the kind of market data technology that we need to deal with. Francis is going to go into a little bit more detail about how that actually works. All right. So let's get into the technology. So given this pretty unique structure of this market data, we created our own specialized database for actually handling that. Uh, it really has this three-tier architecture that you can see up here in the stylized diagram, which starts at the top layer with in-memory data for really rapid access to the most recent data. That then goes into medium-term SSD-like access data uh, for the more medium-term data, and then all the way down to deeper history data that we can use on cheaper storage. We can also do things like dynamically load data from deep history into memory in order to do these computations on the fly. 
Okay, so diving a little bit deeper into this setup, it really consists of a distributed setup running in parallel with data replicated across different nodes. That gives us resiliency during live trading. A few other key things you'll see is that we really use this microservice structure uh, across the board for handling different parts of the workflow. So that really starts at the bottom level for ingestion uh, with the collector process that you can see, all the way to actually feeding the data to clients in the take server process. So yeah, this really ensures that we can handle pretty low latency even during very high spikes of market activity. Okay, so how did we actually re-architect this on the cloud? So um, we, the three-tier architecture is really implemented with a combination of EC2 for that in-memory fast access uh, and compute layer, going down into EBS for the medium-term uh, SSD-like access, and then all the way down to S3 for the infinite storage layer. We also use things like Nomad for process orchestration across the board, uh, and then a few other AWS services like uh, Managed Prometheus for our telemetry, and then other services for key management and encryption. What we really like about this particular architecture is the isolation across environments. Like you see different isolation points across different environments. So it helps actually scale really well as demand changes. And from another perspective, it also lets you scale securely. Right? And there are also other security constraints. Like for example, KMS and secret managers are just bolsters more. And from a monitoring perspective, you have like Prometheus that lets you monitor the container. So that's from a monitoring and operational aspect of things. And what I really like about is in terms of a, from a performance characteristic, there are multiple layers of caching, right? You have like your S3 layer and then the EBS volumes that actually acts as your next layer of caching. So it can really scale and perform at the level that you actually want. And the other nice thing I also see in this architecture is Oh, it can actually be elastic. Like as demand changes, you're able to grow in terms of the different compute units that you want. And as demand changes, you're going to be able to shrink it down when the demand goes down. So it provides you that elasticity as well. So you're not just provisioning for like peak capacity, but you're provisioning for like what you want and scaling up or down as the demand changes. Okay, so once we got this target architecture, the next big question is really how do we actually deploy that? Um, our on-prem setup before was a little bit painful and it consisted of things like securing machines, then actually setting up processes for those different parts that we mentioned, and then um, even opening firewall ports and things like that. So our deployment time was roughly two to three weeks of wartime time for engineers to actually set that up. And with a collection of different AWS services, we're really able to radically reduce that down to five minutes. So it's a pretty significant increase for us. And we'll actually go into detail on the next slide how that's done. Okay, so this is an example request. So really starting just from the left side, you'll see a request goes into the API gateway and then triggers a, a Lambda process to first put some cluster metadata into DynamoDB, as well as trigger a step function that's then going to create separate accounts for uh, each individual cluster. It will also actually create a cloud formation template that can then be deployed on that actual entity. So this gives us a pretty isolated infrastructure, both in terms of security, but then also avoiding any kind of noisy neighbor impact because there's separate clusters in separate uh, accounts and separate VPCs. What we really like about this particular one is the use of AWS step functions. The AWS step functions are primarily like serverless microservices orchestration mechanism. We see step functions let you actually like use like low code visualization to define workflows, whether it's to like orchestrate across like AWS services, or if you have your own microservices, or you have other services that you want to actually integrate. So it lets you actually define your workflow, define your business processes in a workflow manner. And if you see this prevalent and widely used among like many customers. The other aspect here is as part of the workflow service, it captures other aspects of it in terms of like saying failure condition, in terms of being able to actually do retries when fail, failures happen, and also being able to do things in parallel. Right? So you're able to actually define the workflow 
and the service is able to provide you these capabilities. So instead of focusing on the infrastructure, you focus on the business value that you're working on. So it drastically changes what your team would be focusing on. So now we're going to take a look at this in action. So we're going to go through an end-to-end -end demo of how to deploy an instance of our Tick Data Cluster through our developer site. So what you're looking at now is the Goldman Sachs developer site. You see we're going to head over to this clusters tab. And here we can create a new cluster dynamically. And this used to be, as Francis said, a manual setup process. This is now something that we can do fully programmatically. So all we have to do here, enter a name for our cluster, enter a description, set up the size, and in this case, we're going to select the large cluster. Um, that's something essentially running 15 nodes, um, and you'll see this is set up on US East 1. So now when we hit Submit here, essentially this is going to run through that entire cluster deployment uh, setup. So it's going to dynamically uh, allocate new accounts um, and dynamically set up the VPCs. Um, and in a couple of minutes, you know, this will have that running um, on AWS. So we're going to go back now here, and we're going to just uh, select one that we set up earlier. So you can see this is a small cluster. And this one is running now and live. And that whole deployment process is something that we can now do one click through our UI, which used to be, you know, as Francis said, many, many weeks of setup. Once we've actually got a data cluster running on AWS, now we can create a data set. So a data set is essentially kind of a virtual schema of data that we're going to store and manage on that cluster. You can see here, um, we can go in and create a data set. We're going to give it a name in this case, description. Um, this is being done through the UI, but of course, you could do the same thing programmatically. Uh, in this context, we're going to be working with real-time data. So we're going to select intraday frequency, and then we're going to set it to be available on the cluster that we just created. Here you'll see the schema. As we're working with intraday data, time is our primary dimension. And then we have the symbol dimension. In this case, we're going to select asset ID. So we're going to be publishing data against financial market assets that we've created for reInvent. Now we're going to add some measures. These are essentially numerical values. Um, and we're going to add things that are common in, in kind of market data feeds. So we're going to add trade price, volume, and percent change in this example. When we hit submit on this, that will create that data set. Um, so you'll see here a couple of seconds. And now that data set is set up and available to deploy data into that cluster. And you can see here the schema that we just created below. Once that's done, we can flip over, in this case, to a Python interpreter. The script that you're seeing here uh, essentially simulates uh, you know, market data. So what it's going to do is going to generate returns on a normal distribution. Um, and then when we run it, about every 500 milliseconds, it's going to publish that data up to that cluster in that data set running on AWS. So you'll see here when we we'll select this and hit run, uh, in the output, you'll start to see this ticking. So every uh, half a second, we're updating data and publishing that through to that data set through our APIs. If we flip over to one of our analytics tools now, we can actually see what that looks like. So here we're just loading up a, uh, one of our data visualization tools, and you can see now that data across these four financial market assets that we created for this demo is updating in real time. So as we're publishing from Python, um, you can see that updating directly in the system. So what does this mean? You know, essentially, within the space of about 10 minutes, we can do a full end-to-end -end deployment of a brand new data cluster. We can configure that on AWS. Uh, we can create a data set, and it's immediately available for use uh, you know, across these kind of applications running in real time. OK, so now we have the ability to deploy the infrastructure that we need um, and the ability to handle real time market data at scale. So, next, we need to source and model the data that we need to run analytics uh, to take on our original problem. Why is this really hard? Sounds simple sourcing data. OK, so people are probably familiar with the 80-20 rule in data science. You know, 80% of the time is spent actually onboarding, finding, cleaning, and managing data, and 20% actually doing the analysis. So it's a common problem for us as well when we're dealing with quantitative analytics in markets. Let's walk through an example of a kind of typical market data feed onboarding um, and why this is so problematic. OK, first, we need to find data that is suitable for our specific use case. OK, so this includes scouring different available data options, uh, figuring out licensing models, uh, evaluating feeds, negotiating pricing, and essentially running like evaluations to figure out which data feed we're going to use. Then we'll get a dump of the history. Um, this could often be across hundreds of different files. And if you're dealing with kind of 10 years of history, the format could have changed multiple times through that history. So then we have to take that data 
um, you know, map the file formats, and then go through and normalize all of history. And more often than not, we're rewarded with kind of man uh, random inconsistencies in the data, which we have to clean up as we go. Then the real work begins. Then we've got to go through 500 page manuals of different data, understand what the different fields mean, understand how they map to our market models, um, you know, and our view of the world, and essentially go through that, uh, validating the history and getting it into our systems. Once we've done that, we can go through kind of QA processes. And that really falls into two different things. Uh, one is kind of your basic quality assurance checks. So this is things like data delivery time. Uh, is the data there? Do I see large standard deviation moves that are unexpected in data? And the second is more semantic checks. So that's where we're bringing in kind of our market experts and professionals. So that would be things like, you know, has the corporate action lineage of a company changed through time? Have we mapped that correctly historically? Uh, you know, if I'm getting index constituents, do the prices of the constituents and the weights add up to the index level? So these are kind of semantic checks that are specific to different markets that we would run. And so that's a fairly long and involved process, you know, that we have to go through for every data feed. So now we're going to go and attack that problem. Uh, this is a pretty expensive mistake that you'll see commonly across large organizations like ours. So we'll just quickly onboard a data feed. Okay, so you'll go source the file, grab the feed, and then make it available in your application, and then an engineer will do that, and that will probably take you know, some order of weeks or months, but then, great, we're up and running. Sometime later, we have this scenario, and this is pretty common. So what are we looking at? Duplicate data feeds, same source coming in in different places you know, with different formats. Uh, orphan feeds, which lack owners. You know, so there's a feed of data that someone's using in production, but we're not sure who owns it or if it's being maintained or updated. Um, and then, you know, data that we're paying for that isn't being used. So these data feeds that we just kind of keep accruing in our systems, and we're not really sure who's using them or why. And most people kind of look at the cost of their kind of data infrastructure in terms of the, the dollar value of the feeds that they have. Um, but the real true cost is this entire ecosystem. So not just the data that we're consuming, but the whole ecosystem of data onboarding, validation, maintenance, and everything running around it. Okay, so here's our ideal scenario. So we have a centralized data platform, which has the following characteristics. And these characteristics are really not straightforward to achieve. One, rapid onboarding times. So we want to basically minimize and compress the time to onboard data. Um, but we don't want it to be slower than those kind of point-to-point -point interactions. So we don't want to tell our different trading desks, hey, it's going to take an extra six months to onboard data. We need that to be faster, and we need it to be centralized. Uh, two, straightforward data discovery. So how can people find available data that we have licensed that's available coming from our different desks or coming from third-party vendors? And really, the kind of key goal here is to upload and model that data once and use it many times. So we want you know, one team, if they're going to go through all the pain of modeling and uploading that data, to make it available to other teams so they can use it instantly uh, rather than put all that work on the consumer. And then thirdly, entitlements and metrics. So obviously, we need to manage data ownership, entitlements around that, uh, licensing, and then really run optimizations around that to make sure we're being uh, maximally efficient in how we're consuming data. So this is what we want. Um, and really, the fundamental goal here is to just rapidly compress the time to get value from new data at scale. Uh, when we're operating in different markets, uh, different themes are kind of prevalent. We want to be able to act on those as quickly as possible you know, and get the benefit you know, broadly across our organization. So how do we actually go about achieving this, Francis? OK, so what kind of technology can we use to really hit those kind of obje objectives? So firstly, marketplaces like Amazon's data exchange is actually really compressing the time for that sourcing and licensing, really that first step of, of ingestion. Then Glue is a managed ETL service on AWS. So it's basically handling the extraction, transformation, and then loading of the data. And it will also do things like manage those pipelines for you as well. And then finally, we use FinOS Legend, which is a data modeling framework that we actually open source as well to allow us to have consistent data, data models across the board. So how does this actually work in practice? So here's an example request, and really going from the bottom up here, you'll see that we have data in Amazon S3, just like you would in Amazon's data exchange. This flows into AWS Glue, that service. And then you can trigger transformation functions using Lambda to either filter the data or transform it into different ways. And then eventually, it can end up directly into our data service. So that's getting the data in. How do we actually make the discovery a bit more accessible and easy to access? So we created a centralized data catalog that you can actually see here on the right. 
And that really provides us with a kind of one-stop solution for everyone to browse different data sets and get access to them. We also have standardized access APIs with auto-generated code snippets on every single different data set. So once this all comes together, it really just radically reduces that access time. So someone who wants to find a data set to get a code snippet, to put it into the application, they can really be done in like two minutes now. Okay, so we're gonna see what this actually looks like in practice. So here I'm starting in AWS Glue Studio, which is really the UI solution. Typically, however, we would normally set up these processes programmatically ourselves using uh, our SDLC. So here I'm in the studio, I'm just gonna select a source first. Uh, I'm gonna select S3, which uh, is just like you store data in ADX. Then apply some particular transform. In this case, we'd apply different FinOS transformations that we have, but you can make your own custom ones as well. And then really select a target. And here we created our own custom glue connector for connecting directly into that data service to just handle it um, uh, itself. So really, this kind of enables us to have an end-to-end -end cloud native pipeline for getting data in. Here's a resulting data set and what it looks like after you've created it. You can see there's some basic metadata that you have as well as the schema. In the actual data, you can see that we've normalized the country data to specific ISO codes, so countries are represented consistently. And we can also manage permissions. So you can either entitle an individual or an API key or a team to access each of these different data sets. Once you entitle a team, you can also select exactly what actions you want them to do. So here we're just entitling this core data team to be able to query via API. Okay, so once that's updated, you can actually then go on to view that data set in the actual catalog. And this is the experience that anyone across our organization would have for actually accessing that data set. So again, you have the same kind of metadata, you have the fields and schema, uh, and then crucially, you can also, also connect to this API using the different code snippets. So we provide these auto-generated code snippets in different languages that people can just use. Okay, so just zooming out a little bit into our broader catalog, uh, you can see how we have these categories and we have different filters for people to be able to restrict certain areas. Uh, so in this example, we're just uh, gonna filter on cryptocurrency and for intraday data sets. And really that means that we just have this one-stop solution for everyone to be able to discover different data sets and access them immediately. Okay, so we've gone through step one and two. So firstly, data infrastructure. So how do we set up on the cloud uh, the infrastructure we need to manage uh, you know, financial market data? Uh, secondly, uh, data integration and normalization. So how do we get data from different sources, normalize it so it's available for use by our quants in a consistent format, uh, mapped to the entities we need? Uh, and now we're gonna talk a little bit about analytics. So how do we enable different people across our organization to interact with that data uh, through a consistent platform but different types of tools? So firstly, just to give a quick overview of the scale of our analytics environment at Goldman. And this is our current kind of on-premise overall global infrastructure. So on a typical day, you know, with our existing analytics infrastructure, we'll be executing millions of trades. At the same time, we'll be making in order thousands of different code releases as we're executing those trades in the market. Um, and we're doing that at scale. So on an average day, we would transfer, you know, in the order of five petabytes of data backwards and forwards across our analytics environment to the different applications and services that we're working with. So agility for us is critically important, um, and we're gonna use a less typical day uh, to, to show that. What you're seeing in the chart uh, behind this uh, on the slide here is crude oil price, uh, prices in April 2020. Uh, what you'll see is the price you know, started to drop a little bit in the morning, and then rapidly started to drop you know, towards about midday, hit zero, and then within the space of about 20 minutes, uh, went down to minus $40 a barrel. So it's a pretty extreme event for us. Uh, what does that mean? That's great, right? I can go fill up my car and get paid for it. Not quite. In this instance, uh, you know, it's actually some specific dynamics around transportation of oil that made it actually more expensive than the cost of oil to transport from the delivery point. And that's why you're seeing these market dynamics in this instance. But when it comes to analytics, you know, what does that mean for us kind of broadly from an infrastructure and technology perspective? 
Well, firstly, it means making changes to us intraday in real time as we're trading is critically important, right? So we need to be able to correct for this stuff, update our models, um, you know, and interact with our infrastructure while this is happening to make sure we have an accurate view on our risk. Uh, secondly, obviously, we need to help our, you know, say, uh, salespeople, traders, and other people across our organization. And of course, our clients understand what's happening in the market. So we need the right tools that allow us to quickly understand, uh, you know, what's happening in the market, why, analyze it, uh, you know, and come up with uh, a reaction to that. So let's look at the kind of the newer tools that we're using to do data analytics. So that was kind of the overall Goldman Analytics ecosystem. Wow. These are the kind of things that we're doing, you know, more recently uh, in terms of interacting with data. So what do we want? We want a range of different tools that are optimized for the different personas that interact with them. So that could be, uh, you know, specialized tools for looking at markets, which might be used for our, uh, by our salespeople and traders to kind of rapidly understand what's going on and communicate with clients. Um, it could be things like notebooks for quants who want to interact, you know, very rapidly in a kind of Python type environment. Or it could mean the underlying APIs, you know, for our engineers who want to build on top of the same platform and do it at scale, uh, you know, at high performance. And really what we're trying to achieve is a consistent platform that can handle all of these use cases and give different people views onto the same data in a way that they're comfortable with and they can work with rapidly. This is a kind of overview of how we achieve that. I'm going from the bottom to the top again. What we really want is our standardized centralized data platform at the bottom so we can serve different use cases in different ways. Uh, at the top layer, you've got the different interaction points. So we have our own applications that we build that Francis is going to talk a little bit about and show um, that are optimized for dealing with financial markets. Um, things like hosted notebook environments so we can collaborate very quickly and take advantage of the latest things in the Python ecosystem or scientific computing ecosystem. And in the middle layer, uh, we want our quants to be able to interact with this environment. So essentially, we want them to be able to write kind of plug-in code, inject that into our runtime, uh, and operate at scale, so running on top of the same platform that we're supporting 24, uh, 24 by 7, but taking advantage of those quant, uh, those quant uh, routines in the ecosystem. And then lastly, you know, being on the cloud, we can now take advantage of you know, the broader AWS ecosystem. So we can co-locate, as Francis said, our data with our compute, um, and use things like the thin space notebook envir uh, uh, environment, which we'll show. Okay, so really the foundational piece of all of this is our Python SDK, which we call GSQuant, and we open source. You can actually check it out on GitHub as well. Uh, it contains a broad array of different time series analytics functions, but it's also an entry point to all of our different APIs. So that includes things like our data access APIs or our pricing and risk APIs and so on. This also gives us a consistent model across the board for referring to different financial markets that we can not only use ourselves internally, but we can actually reason with our clients with as well because it's open source. So, so going just one layer above that is really a data analytics solution. And here you can see a UI of our application. We call it Plotal Pro. And it really allows you to do various time series analytics. You'll see here actually that rather than creating like a point and click solution for just selecting data, uh, we created our own custom DSL, domain specific language, that's specifically for financial time series analytics. This gives us a lot of flexibility to do any kind of investment analysis that we want. One other really nice feature is that uh, it also gives us an on-ramp for our entire sales and trading workforce who aren't necessarily coders, but we can now actually on-ramp them into these low-code workflows. Okay, so one other nice property just of the language that's worth mentioning is um, it's not only uh, yeah, interactive, it's also a functional language. So it has a lot of nice different properties like being able to do parallel execution or actually just evaluate um, different graph nodes only once. So in this particular example, we actually have three lines of code in Plot Tool Pro, um, and each of them is actually referring to Amazon's stock price. Now, because we're referring it three times, actually, we only need to evaluate it once. Uh, and it'll just operate much faster. OK, so one of the key advantages that we just have on this cloud migration is that we can actually start to connect uh, both our data and compute together. We can co-locate them. And we already mentioned ADX uh, for getting the data acquisition part. But we've actually also been working with the FinSpace team and to form a collaboration. So what this actually means in practice is that developers who are using FinSpace 
they already get GSQuant pre-installed, they can use it immediately, and they can pull that data into different Spark clusters to do massively parallel compute. This also gives them a completely managed uh, notebook environment that they can just use straight away. Yeah, Amazon Flint Space is a data management and an analytics platform primarily built for like financial services industry. And one of the benefits you see here with the integration with GS Vida and Quant Analytics framework is we are able to surface GS curated data set onto the Flint Space uh, catalog, like you're able to still actually surface that. And given that the FinSpace environment has these Spark clusters, you're also able to scale up your analytics tremendously. So that's another aspect we see from the integration. And also with the Jupyter Notebook interface that's along with FinSpace, so it gives the quant and analyst an interactive environment that they can work off with. So the integration actually makes this possible. So now we're going to put everything together, and we're going to go back to that problem that we outlined in the, at the beginning of the presentation, and we're going to go through a full end-to-end -end of how we'd solve it. Okay, so what you're seeing here is a kind of notebook where we put together a back test to run that uh, specific analytics problem in GSQuant. Um, so what this is, Python script, it's importing GSQuant, and then it's going to go through and essentially optimize a portfolio historically, uh, selecting stocks that have exposure to the quality and value factors that I mentioned, and then use a risk model to neutralize all other uh, factor exposures within some constraint. The highlighted code is now going to run that simulation historically, so it's going to rebalance that portfolio at different points in time, and then compute the performance of the, of the back test historically. If we take a look here, uh, we can see the current uh, position, so the latest rebalance of the portfolio that we're holding, and just pull up you know, some of the stocks uh, that we're holding you know, as of uh, the latest date. And you can see here a bunch of kind of industrials, energy, material stocks, uh, you know, going back to our original kind of economic scenario, they're kind of topical in this, uh, in this environment. Uh, now we're going to flip into the plot tool analytics uh, application that Francis talked about, and you can see the blue line is the performance of our portfolio, and the red is the benchmark, in this case, MSCI World. Now, very quickly, you can see we're doing the type aheads. We can look at the performance of our portfolio, just proxy it versus the benchmark, just to see how well this strategy would have done historically and how it would have outperformed or not. We'll hide the other two lines quickly, and there you can see over the last year, uh, this strategy would have outperformed fairly significantly, uh, the benchmark. But these tools allow us to do things very rapidly, so we can say, okay, but how would that correlate with our broader portfolio? And these functions that you're seeing being run here, in this case, rolling one-month correlation, is you know, available through that GSConf framework and embedded into this application. So very quickly, uh, we can do market analytics, we can look at our back tests, and we can look at how these strategies would have performed. And here we just click to go to five years, and we'll see now how's the evolution of that correlation moved over time. So this is a very, very rapid analytics for us that we use across our trading floor to interact with this kind of data and interact with the custom DSLs that Francis described. Now we'll take a look at the FinSpace integration. What you can see is we're now going to run a simulation. What we're going to do, we're going to take the re uh, most recent positions from that portfolio, we're going to get factor exposures, and we're going to run many different simulations across hundreds of different risk factors to look at what could happen on the forward in our portfolio. And this is the output. You'll see a distribution of P&L, or distribution of returns here. And what it's telling us, if you look at the left-hand uh, red line, so that's the two standard deviation line on the, on the, the bottom side, on the downside, uh, this is telling us with 95% confidence on a $100 million portfolio, uh, over a course of a year, we'll lose less than $45 million. And that was run across 100,000 different observations. So here now, because we're on the cloud, we can scale up our data and our compute in parallel. So what have we shown here? Um, really, for the first time, we can do an end-to-end -end deployment on the cloud, uh, full, all the way from kind of data acquisition, sourcing, normalization, and management, uh, through to the analytics environment that we want to integrate with. Um, you know, and we can basically do that uh, seamlessly in one environment. And this really has given us the ability to take things that would normally take months uh, and compress them down to minutes. So that's super exciting for us across our organization. So what's next? We're going to talk a little bit about what we're doing next. But before we do that, Francis, what did we learn? All right. So, so any kind of architecture design is all about managing different constraints and different trade-offs. And we'll just go through a few of the lessons that we learned, either things that went well or things that could have gone better. So it was pretty clear to us, actually, from the beginning that we wanted to design with security considered upfront. 
So that's when we started with the separate isolated cluster setup. But if you have a fully single tenant solution, that also introduces other risks, like you have a lot more infrastructure to manage and uh, you don't really have the same kind of operator simplicity. So we really ended up with a cellular-like style architecture where we have isolation and security where it's most critical, but we also share parts of the infrastructure where it makes sense. So for example, we, we share the routing infrastructure across different uh, clusters. Secondly, just some caution around risk management. So unless you're actually going to be starting from scratch, you're gonna be running in some kind of hybrid mode. And uh, if you are, having just very clear procedures and failovers for how to switch between each of the two infrastructures is just critical. And yeah, we could have avoided some early on incidents by just uh, really nailing that early on. So finally, just on the performance side. So when we are looking at migrating our infrastructure from, from on-prem to AWS, we presume that for the middle layer of our storage, we would use something like an instant storage solution because it's much more like uh, uh, immediate SSD access uh, on the machine. But actually, when we looked into it much deeper, EBS performance was more than good enough, and actually its durability is just significantly better. So again, that just helps a lot with operator simplicity across the board. So where are we going next? Um, as anyone that attended the keynote uh, probably saw this morning, we're introducing our financial cloud for data. Um, so this is a really significant step forward for us. Um, this is the first time we're gonna enable our clients to leverage the same infrastructure we use for what we just described today, data analytics uh, um, and data management, um, through entirely managed services deployed on AWS. So one of the kind of core philosophies when we started out on this journey um, was internal equals external. So can we design our infrastructure such that our customers can use the exact same APIs, services, and data, you know, subject to entitlements and licensing um, that we use across our trading floor. And that's really kind of taking a leaf out of the AWS playbook, and it's really important for us to design that upfront, you know, because you really need to think about these things uh, when you start rather than try to retrofit it later. Um, so the goal for us here really is to lower the barrier to entry to quantitative finance, you know, across our client constituency. So can we basically take the same technology deploy it and package it in a way, and obviously the AWS environment, the marketplace, uh, and the ecosystem is super valuable for us in order to be able to do that, um, and get it to our clients so they can access the same tools and the same workflows you know, that were previously probably out of reach without very, very large engineering teams, uh, and do that quickly on demand and kind of have this kind of technology available. And secondly, really one of the core focuses for us is designed for developers. Um, so, you know, this is a uh, you know, services designed to be used fully API first, uh, manage services essentially to look like other things than uh, services that you'd run on the cloud. Um, and you know, as developers ourselves, we wanna retain full control of our technology strategy. So can our clients integrate these services but retain control of the technology that they're building and essentially delegate some of these kind of foundational components to GS um, and, you know, and rapidly increase their velocity or the capabilities they have. And really our aspiration here and our hope is that the next generation of financial services, technology and businesses will be built on top of this technology. So that's really what we're looking to achieve. Okay, so for more information on anything you see here, please feel free to reach out to Francis, myself, or the team. Um, we're at booth 540, so please drop by if you wanna speak to anyone uh, and get any more information. Uh, I just wanna give a really big shout out to the team who worked on this globally, and also our colleagues at AWS who made all this possible. <laughs> so thank you for everyone and doing this uh, amazing job to put this together. Um, we're all going to the kind of FSI lounge where Goldman Sachs will be hosting for the next hour. So if you want to meet any of the engineers that actually did the work on this, uh, you know, or talk to us about what we've done here or what we're offering to our clients, uh, please feel free to drop by. Uh, that's on level four of the Venetian in the West Alcove, so it's just down the stairs uh, one flight, so we'll be there. Um, and then finally, I just want to thank everyone for attending. Hopefully you guys found this informative. Um, please reach out with any questions. Uh, we're super interested to talk about the kind of problems that uh, you all have. Um, and engage with our engineering team. So with that, thank you, I'll wrap it up. Thank you.